وإذا أنعمنا على الإنسان أعرض ونآ بجانبه وإذا مسه الشر كان يأوسا قل كل يعمل على شاكلته فربكم أعلم بمن هو أهدى سبيلا ويسألونك عن الروح قل الروح من أمر ربي وما أوتيتم من العلم إلا قليلا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so inshallah in this brief reminder I want to share with you some um, ta'amulat some reflections from three ayat that belong to Surah Al Isra this is the seventeenth surah and these are ayat number 83, 84, and 85. Allah Azza wa says, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ When we shower favor onto the human being, أَعْرَضْ That the human being ignores it, deliberately ignores it. The suggestion here is that when human beings are given lots of gifts by Allah, human beings start becoming deluded into thinking somehow they deserve them, or they are entitled to them, or this is because of their own doing, or their own accomplishments, or their own capability. So they completely ignore the fact that these are favors, they actually start thinking they own them or they're entitled to them in one way or the other. bihi, And he turns away to his side. In other words, this is kind of a, let me give you an English translation, an American English translation of na'a <laughs> bihi. That's na'a bihi. Okay? So this guy, when somebody says Allah has given you a lot of favor, <laughs> that's literally captured in language. Okay? That's what he does. So he huffs and puffs about the things that Allah has given and dismisses the idea that this is somehow a divine gift. وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرْ And when harm touches him, when harm hits him, كَانَ يَأُوسَى he, he becomes altogether depressed, full of sadness. Allah has done this to me. Why, why am I being put through this? What did I do to deserve this? When good happens, I deserved it. And it was my doing. But when bad happens, it wasn't my doing, it's Allah's doing. Allah did this to me. كَانَ يَأُوسَى This twisted mind of his. On a side note, What's really remarkable about this ayah is actually a lesson in adab, a lesson in etiquette and how we not only talk, uh, think about Allah, but even how we talk about Allah. And obviously you all know that speech, the way a person speaks is a manifestation of how they think, right? So when, when favor is mentioned, Allah says, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ This is a past tense, أَنْعَمْنَا Who's the doer? What's the fa'il? لَمِيرْ مُسْتَتِرْ تَغْدِيرُهُ نَحْنُ It's Allah. We shower him. But when it says, وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ when favor is mentioned, then the doer, the subject of the verb is Allah. When we shower him with favor. When harm hits him, Allah says, Massa, huwa massa. And the outside doer, the fa'il is asharru. When harm hits him, when harm touches him. In other words, Allah did not associate himself with harm. Okay? So Allah did not say, when we make harm touch him. Or we afflict him with harm. He didn't do that. He didn't associate harm to himself. And this is actually teaching us something, a very deep concept in our religion about harm and benefit in this world. At the end of the day, what's our belief? Everything is from Allah. When someone gets sick, it's from Allah. When someone gets better, it's from Allah. That's our belief. Nothing happens except for the will of Allah. But that doesn't mean that we get to talk about it like that. Even though that's the reality, there's supposed to be a certain level of respect. Why is that? And you have to, if it's truth, it's truth. You should just be able to say it. Why code it with formality? This is also an important lesson. Allah teaches us in a way that is suitable for all human beings. You see, a mature student, a mature believer, they know that when good happens, there's good in it. And when that bad happens, there's also good in it. And all of it is a test. This is a mature believer. But anyone short of being mature, anyone that's not that mature in their faith, then when bad happens and you say it's from Allah, how do they think of it? Literally as Allah did something bad and He means something bad by it. Like they cannot process anything more mature than that, right? So Allah reveals language that for someone who's deeply going to reflect will also understand, but somebody who just looks at it on the surface level can still appreciate and not get the wrong conclusion. Harm touched him. Allah did not say when harm, Allah harmed him. Allah didn't say it like that. Because for the immature, just listening to that, he just get messed up. And he's actually correcting the immature by saying, وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرْ so when harm touches him, he becomes entirely depressed. He becomes overwhelmed. Ya'us actually, fa'ul, this is from ya'is, is, is, is mubalagha, extremely depressed. You know, there are some people who are used to success. 
they're used to just getting 100, they're used to winning every race, they're used to winning every game, they're used to being number one at everything, you know? They're used to getting their parents to listen to everything they say, et cetera, et cetera. Then one time they don't get their way. And what happens to those kinds of people? Those are the kinds of people in life that have a really hard time dealing with failure, or dealing with loss, or dealing with a challenge. People that take the hits all the time, like the fourth kid or fifth kid or something in a family, it's all good. Or the youngest one, you know, youngest kids, like, you know, I'm afraid for my youngest one because, you know, she can get away with pretty much anything. You know, because at the time, by the time you get to the youngest age, then, you know, for some reason the policing of your parents just, I don't know where it goes. Like I tell my mother and father that about my youngest sister. They were tough on us, but my, my youngest sister gets away with that. And I'm like, Mom, what happened? What? This was not policy with us. How is she getting away? No, choti hai, Like, she's so little. She's not little. You know? So, uh, what happens with people? They get spoiled. Favors can spoil someone. And so when a little bit is taken away, they become entirely depressed. Entirely depressed. Now this lesson that Allah teaches us, you know, about favor and being, you know, harm touching you, all of us in this dunya have been given a limited number of ni'mah and a limited number of sharr. Right, on the one hand, Allah has decided what our rizq is going to be. Our rizq, our provision includes our money, but it also includes our friends, it includes our, life, our families are rizq. You know, our knowledge is our risk. The people who teach us is our, our, our risk. The people who learn from us are our risk. Our children are our risk. Every, every good you have in your life is basically your risk. And you have a set, you don't have an unlimited amount of this stuff. Where do you get the unlimited stuff? You get that in Jannah. Here, there's a limited supply of what you're going to get. It's written for you. Then on top of that, there's a limited number of challenges that you're going to face in this life. Allah is not going to give you any more than, or any less than what He's written for you. That's it. It's, it's declared, this is what your lot in life is. Now if you internalize that, then your challenges and your opportunities, if you put it in, those language, in that language, that your challenges and your opportunities are not the same as my challenges and my opportunities. Okay? They're not the same. And sometimes Allah opens a door of opportunity, but you refuse to walk through it. Like He opened it, and you could have reaped a lot of reward for, from it. But you chose to not walk through it. And then you end up suffering. And then you end up blaming Allah instead. So now, if this is the case, everyone has a different lot in life. Everyone has a different set of challenges, a different set of opportunities. Then the question arises, why? Why not all of us have the same thing? Why not, why not all of us have the same set of challenges? Make it consistent. The next ayah answers that question. He says, قُلْ كُلٌّ يَعْمَلُوا عَلَىٰ شَاكِلَتِهِ Tell them, let everyone work. Everyone should work. Kullun ya'malu actually means everyone should try to work. When a mudari' becomes a sifa, it's actually in the meaning of trying to do something. Everybody should try to work on their shakila. Now what is shakila? Shakil in Arabic is form. Shakil is the appearance of something and the mold of something. Okay? You can even say the shape of something is shakila. In a figurative sense, you can call it I use psychological terminology now, your predisposition. You're pre-programmed a certain way. You know, some people have a good sense of humor, some people are very serious, some people are oriented towards science, others towards literature, some are very artistic, you know, uh, some are, you know, they have a hard time figuring out what they are, but they're, you know, but they know how to have a good time, you know. There are people with different personalities, different shakilat, you can say. Allah says everybody, first of all, recognize what Allah has given you, what kind of personality Allah has given you, and then work in accordance with that. In other words, shakila, you see the tamar buta at the end, makes it actually a marra, meaning an instant, an individual thing. Not two people have the same shakila. Allah made personalities very, very, very different. And everybody should try to figure out what their personality is like as much as they can. And then in accordance with that, figure out what is the most they can make of their opportunities. What are the most they can, and what are the challenges in their personality? What are some shortcomings they have, and how can they overcome them? This is actually a very powerful concept at the individual level, but it's so powerful that Allah in another place in the Quran even describes this at the level of nations. You know, one of the names for nations in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا كُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا Shu'uban comes from the word Sha'ab or Shu'bah in Old Arabic, which actually means a dent or a crack in a wall. An imperfection is a shab. It's an imperfection. As if to say every nation has some 
some good qualities, but some quirks. And nations have to get to know each other, so they learn from each other's strengths. Because one nation's strength is another nation's weakness, and one nation's weakness is another nation's strength. In my culture, there are some things that are really bad. I should learn from another nation. Like if I'm a Desi, our dietary habits are really bad. So maybe I should learn from another nation that has much healthier eating practices. Whose 70 year olds go jogging. You know, where our 40 year olds are on a cane. You know, so maybe there's something wrong with our culture that we can learn from another culture. That's at the level of nations even. But even at the level of an individual, if someone's able to recognize their weaknesses, then they're able to make connections, make friends, uh, you know, put themselves around people that turn that, that cover for that weakness. That they recognize that weakness and they cover for that weakness. You see, if you surround yourself with people that have the same weaknesses as you, they have the same problem as you. Like if you have a terrible sense of humor, you have no restrictions on your sense of humor, and you become friends with other people who also have no breaks in their sense of humor, not very good things will come out of that relationship. Maybe someone in this relationship should have what? Some, some, some sense of, okay guys, that's enough. Let's cut it out. You see what I'm saying? Somebody has to be there. And, but if, by the way, if everybody's super serious, and all your, you're serious and all your friends are super that's a very depressing life. You need somebody to stir things up. Now in terms of deen, in terms of what Allah wants you to do with your life, everybody should instead of complaining, or you only get happy when good things happen, and you get super depressed when bad things happen, the reality of it is, each of you will have your share of good and bad in this world, and you need to make the most of it given your personality, given your shakila. فَرَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُوا بِمَنْ هُوَ أَهْدَى سَبِيلًا Then your master knows who is more guided in terms of a path. You know, and he didn't say as sabil either, he said sabilan. He made it actually, this is a tamiz of it, in terms of a path, suggesting that each one of us will have a course, depending on our shakila. Now, which raises another question. Where did these different personalities come from? How come we have different personalities? You know, in, in psychology studies, they study genetic twins. One's favorite color is blue and the other's favorite color is purple and they're like, we can't figure this out. Genetically, they're the same. They're, you know, because some said, your, your personality is a product of your genes and your environment. Right? Nature and nurture. But then they can't figure out these cases where the nature is the same, genetically they're the same, and they're brought up in what? Same household. So their nature is the same and their nurture is the same, but this guy likes bicycles and that, that guy likes boats. Or whatever, you know? This one's into sports and that one's into chess. And they can't figure this out. You know? Genetic twins, how can they do this? Allah Azza wa Jal actually answers this question. And He says, there is something mysterious about you and what's going on inside you. The next ayah is, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They ask you about the ruh, the essence of the human being. By the way, ruh, ruh, uh, interesting word in Arabic, associated with rawh, like farawhun wa joy, pleasure, contentment, satisfaction, there's something inside of us that is the source of our happiness, is the source of our contentment, and it's distinct to each and every one of us. We can only know very little about it. Allah says, they ask you about the ruh, tell them the ruh is from the command of my master. Min amri rabbi. You know, Shawali Ullah Dehilbi rahimahullah used to argue that there are two worlds of Allah's doings. There's the alamul khalq and alamul amr. Alamul khalq, the world of creation and the world of command. And what he meant by that is, that Allah created this universe, a physical universe, in which there are certain laws that govern it. It's, it's, it's dictated by time, for instance, when you plant a seed in the ground, it doesn't just pop up into a tree, right? There's a process by which it turns into a tree. A baby doesn't just turn into a man overnight, or a woman overnight. There's a process, there's a time. And this is the world of khalq. Allah made things with tadarruj in the world of khalq. There's a process and progression in the world of khalq. But there's the alam of al-amr. There's the world of amr where Allah commands something and it comes into full formation to perfection when? Instantaneously. Like the angels are from what? Alam al-Amr. The Ruh is from what? Alam al-Amr. The Quran is from? Alam al-Amr. Right, so there's this unseen world where things happen. They're first of all not limited by time like we think of time. They're not limited by distance like we think of distance. They're not limited by process like we think of process. It's, an, it's its own entity, the, the world of Al-Amr, the Amr of Allah. Which is why you know the, when Amr is mentioned, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُمْ When he says Amr, he gives the Amr that it should be, and it comes into existence immediately. 
It happens immediately. That's the world of Allah's Amr. So, and these two worlds seem to be separate most of the time. In us as human beings, we actually have, our, our physical growth is from Alam Al-Khalq, and our spiritual entity belongs to Alam Al-Amr. Prophets والسلام, are teaching people, but their teachings come from where? Alam Al-Amr. And the miracles that they're given, which break Alam Al-Khalq, because they belong to Alam Al-Amr, right? So the, the fire stops burning in Ibrahim Alayhi case, that's from the Amr. Now Allah is saying that your ruh, something inside you belongs to Alam Al-Amr. قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي It's from the Amr of my Rabb. And how much do we know about angels? How much do we really know about, you know, the world of Amr? Not much. You know, we can have some idea that whatever Allah tells us, we can have. Otherwise, it's entirely unseen and unexperienced to us. So actually, what we're learning then is, there is something inside of us, inside of you and inside of me, that is the essence of my personality, and yet, I know about it very little. وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have been given about knowledge, from within its knowledge, within knowledge itself, very, very little. There's something inside us so powerful that we can't even know it ourselves. Now, think about this in, in retrospect. You know, the, the human brain, the physical brain, this is not ar-ruh, this is just some gray matter and some electrical signals going off between microscopic cells over here. This stuff, how much do you know, neuroscientists know about the brain? After all this research, they, they tend to say we know almost nothing. We're only beginning to scratch the surface. And that's within the alam of what? Al-khalq. So how are we going to know anything really about alam al-amr, the ruh? So what Allah is teaching us then is that we have to go on this exp expedition. When you work towards your predisposition, you will discover more about yourself. You will not discover who you are until you put yourself to work. And this is the lesson I want to leave you with. Young people nowadays, especially young people nowadays, say, I don't know what I should do. Stop telling me what I should do. What should I major in? What kind of job should I do? And they don't do anything. And they get 30 bits of advice from someone. Then they go to someone else and get another 40 bits of advice. Then they go to someone else and get another 50 bits of advice. And they have all this advice from all these people and they say, well, I asked a hundred people and I got a hundred different kinds of advice. Yes, that's because you asked a hundred people and you got a hundred different kinds of advice because human beings are individuals. They're going to give you individual advice. Until you put yourself to work, you're not going to discover who you are. You're not going to know your strengths and you're not going to know your weaknesses. Stop being afraid of work. Stop being afraid of jumping in, trying something, failing. Failure is good for you. It exposes the holes in the wall. It exposes what you need to work on. It also exposes the few things that you are good at and maybe you should refine them even more. But that does not happen until you grind it out. Until you throw yourself in the middle, in the mix. You know? I'd like you to think of the fact that, you know, our ruh is from Alam Al Amr. But this life that Allah gave us here, in which we can put ourselves to work and discover ourselves, is not an unlimited life, is it? So, between coming of age and sleep, and then old age where you pretty much become senile, we don't have a lot of years to figure ourselves out, to put ourselves to work. So don't be afraid to try things. Allah has given us this incredible adventure in the world. Don't be scared to try stuff. Try, I mean, the fact that you've taken the adventure to try to learn Arabic is cool, but that's just the beginning. Try things in business, try things in your education, try things in, you know, try a different kind of job, try things. And if you live your life just afraid, I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. I'm not sure if it's, I'm going to succeed at that or not. And those are the kinds of people that will only sit on the sidelines and not do anything in life. You know, you have to stop being afraid of failure. You have to work on your shakila. You, just, you have to let go of that inhibition. And once you let go of it, amazing things will happen in your life. When you stop being depressed about failures. You know, my favorite student, I've taught, you know, Dream's been around for now five, you guys are year number five, it's crazy. You guys are year number five. One of my favorite students of all time, I'm not gonna name him. You know what his problem was? Allah created, I say Allah created him not to learn Arabic. That's what I say about him, he's my favorite student. I love him to death. This guy, no matter how hard, and he studied harder than anyone else I know. Day in, 
day out. He's sitting in class, breaks. Everybody else is playing ping pong or slapping each other. He's studying. People are taking lunch breaks. He's studying. He's buried in the notes. He's buried in review. He's always asking questions, studying, studying, studying. He's got piles and piles of notebooks that are filled up with his notes and get another one and another one and another one. His hand's starting to hurt. No, I'm not gonna use a laptop because that's for lazy people. I'm gonna study. And he's one of my close friends. And he, he and I used to hang out a lot before. I was like, hey, why don't you come learn some Arabic? He goes, yeah, I'll do it. And he jumps in. And then now during the year, I call him, hey, you wanna go hang out, get some pizza or something? No, bro, I gotta study. I'm his teacher during the day. And at night I'm thinking, hey, you wanna go hang out? No, bro, I gotta study. Thanks a lot, click. <laughs> and he, on so many exams, failed miserably. Failed miserably, but I don't feel bad for him at all. That is effort worth doing. That, and there are people who did not apply themselves and got easy hundreds. And I'm, I don't, first of all, I don't even think it was worth their time, the education they received. And I don't respect what they did. I respect what he did. He's, I'm going to try something and I'm going to give it my best. I'm not going to run at the first sign of failure. I'm not just going to walk away and just do something else. You know, where there's this idea that even the, the, the line of work you're going to do, the career, the pursuits you're going to make, the efforts you're going to make, so long as you find them enjoyable, you should do it. The moment you have a boring day or two, you should be like, I need to do something else. I'm going to move on to something else. Really? Really? This is not Jannah. You have good days and bad days. This life is like that. When shower, favors are being showered, everything's happy. I'm perfect. This is the way I need to be. And the moment things don't go your way, kana ya usa. You become super depressed. I don't know if this is the thing for me. I don't know if I should even be doing this. It happens to students. They fail one test. Or no, no, not fail. Sorry, got a 95. Astaghfirullah. How will you show your face to your parents? Who will marry you now? that you have a 95, you know. I don't know if I should drop out now because it's not even worth it anymore. Are you serious? Get, put, you know, get a little, grow a spine. Grow a spine, grow a thick skin. Put you, apply yourself in whatever you do. In whatever you do. And this is not just about your studies at the program, at, at DREAM. This is beyond that. In life, have that attitude. Whatever you jump into, really dive in. Dive in, dive all in. Yes, seek counsel. But don't overseek counsel. Don't keep getting advice and getting advice and getting advice and not doing anything. You know, you have a few people in your life you can trust. And you, sometimes some people, you know, they, 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 like, they get into this habit where they like to get advice from people, they know they're going to get two different answers. Because they, they, they live off of the confusion. They feed off of it. They use that as a scapegoat to not do anything. Well, he said this, but you said this. And they wait for you to say something and say, but he said this. You could have told me that before I told you anything, but... You know what? Seek advice, but seek advice with a purpose. And seek advice with some trust. You shouldn't just ask random people. By the way, if you're seeking contradictory advice from people, you know what that says? That says, first of all, you have no confidence, number one. And number two, it says you don't trust people. You don't trust them. Why are you asking their advice if you want an alternative opinion? You don't have to take everybody's opinion. You don't have to take my opinion, or Shaykh Omar Suleiman's opinion, or Shaykh Abdul Nasser's opinion, or anybody's opinion for that matter. You consider their opinion, and you make your own judgment. But once you make your own judgment, فَإِذَا azant, When you make a decision, فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Trust Allah and move on with life. Trust Allah. This is how you get to discover yourself. And that's actually a very important lesson in life that Muslims, all of you, have to internalize. And inshallah ta'ala, great things will come for you in life and for the benefit of others in your life if you internalize this. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, my name's iPhone 6 Plus. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in fairy tales that some creature with intelligence created me. It's gonna do this! Oh,